uh, it is great that uh, we are joined by one of the deep scholars and very well known scholar for all of us, at least for our circle, Professor Gyan Luigi Segaliriba from Italy. Uh, the session will be chaired by respected uh, uh, Dr. Uh, A. Raghu Kumarji, uh, who is a convener and uh, nurturing uh, center for social dialogue, Hyderabad. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Mohanti. And uh, we'll be very soon joined by Alok Bajpai and uh, Jan Singh Tomarji. Uh, the topic that we have chose for today's discussion is understanding democracy in the context of individual rights, group rights, and multiculturalism. We have received a very uh, deep article uh, by uh, Professor Gyan Louis Segelva. The article is titled is the individual rights, group rights, and multiculturalism notes on the position of Wilke Milka, Chandran, Dren, uh, Pushpestas, and uh, Vreni uh, Veri. And uh, this article is very uh, insightful for all of us because we are also engaging uh, in terms of uh, the very contestation between group rights and individual rights, so far as the politics of UCC is concerned, so far as the uh, politics of uh, minority is concerned in India. So this is a very sound and theoretical article. Uh, so first I would request uh, Professor Gyan Loigi Bas Segelva, who is very well known for all of us. Uh, he completed his PhD from PISA and he has a deep uh, engagement with the philosophical work of Mahatma Gandhi and uh, work of Amrit Sen. He has a very multidimensional orientation in terms of uh, research. And uh, we have uh, uh, read some of his best articles uh, recently uh, in many of our friends' uh, book chapters. And he contributed in our uh, circle. And he is also a very uh, uh, a deep seeker. And he is a part of Biswanidhan Center for Asian Prosumi, which is a public intellectual trust based in Puducherry and Chennai. And he has recently uh, joined International Academy of Ethics, which is a, one of the world's leading uh, think tank of public intellectuals. Uh, so thank you, Professor Gyan. Now I request you to share your presentation in 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have chair remark followed by question and answer. Professor Gyan, over to you. Thank you very much. I hope I am audible. Uh, well, yes. I do not know whether uh, it is all right. Now I will only... I have only to reduce here, and yes, I I hope that uh, it, it is the is it the presentation visible or it you is, have problems? Thank you very much. Perfect. Well, I have prepared this presentation which um, deals with these authors with aspect of these authors. I will I probably will not have the time to uh, speak diffusely of all the authors because. They are complex authors and they have different positions as we are going to see, but let's see what we can do. So our title is Understanding Democracy and the Context of Individual Rights, Group Rights and Multiculturalism. I, of course, thank you very much for your interest, for your invitation. Here are the addresses. I will upload the PowerPoint, the slides on my page on Academia Edu and also on ResearchGate and of course I can send to everybody who wants to receive it and um, 
there is perhaps a note which I have to mention that is, if you see pages with uh, design, these are quotations of the authors. Otherwise, if the pages have no design, these pages are, excuse me, these pages are my notes, my observation, my reflections. Now I am going to present the authors and to present the main ideas in a, a synthesis. Um, the uh, presentation deals, as said, with the interpretation of liberalism and multiculturalism and of group rights and of rights. They based my positions, my observations on these four thinkers, that is, uh, Will Kumlika, Chandran Kukatas, Dorian Lambelet Coleman, and Brian Berry. They are very different from each other, as we are going to see. Uh, yeah, is a short presentation of the persons, but perhaps I can spring over it and we can speak ev eventually the, uh, about this point in the discussion. But the mutual connection between the mentioned thing I say this, uh, and this is the ground of my choice, as it is the their, um, their specific analysis of rights, of liberalism and the multiculturalism. Kumlika, who is a Canadian professor, considers the legitimacy of a group rights as an extension, integration, and completion of traditional individual rights. That is, in Kimrika's view, the extension of traditional individual rights proves to be necessary due to the insufficiency of traditional individual rights. Kimrika shows in his studies, there are very many, that a country can have to face questions and to cope with problems which cannot be solved on the basis of traditional individual rights since these questions and problems go beyond the sphere of traditional individual rights, of individual rights, of rights to speech, of speech and so on, of vote and so on. Traditional individual rights are, for instance, not appropriate for the defense of minorities within a country, at least in Kumlikov's views, since they have been thought out as a form of defense of the individuals and are concentrated on the individual dimension. That is not on the dimension of the group, but on the dimension of the individual. Kumlika is nonetheless aware that the acknowledgement and concession of group rights within a country may not mean that individuals become the property of a group or that group rights trump individual rights. In other words, individual rights ought to remain the foundation of our rights. In Kim Lucas' views, Kim Lucas is very clear about this point. Individual rights cannot are not expendable. They are to be completed through group rights, but not substituted by group rights. Only those group rights which are compatible with traditional individual rights may be admitted within a liberal country. Kukatas is completely different and, on, different and on the basis of his interpretation of liberalism as toleration, strongly limits the right of intervention of the state in the life and culture of the groups. The state does not have an immediate right to intervene in the life of the groups. The state is not a moral authority. It is exclusively the place of convergence of different groups which are independent of each other. The state is not a superior instance which might give the address of morality to the different groups, i.e. which might determine the correct moral values for all its inhabitants. The state is not this, it's not a supervisor. The state is exclusively the keeper of the public order. It must promote and protect the toleration between the different groups, but no, no, nothing more than this. And this, the state is exclusively a keeper of the public order, of the coexistence and the possibility of coexistence between parts of the society and of the peace between the groups living in it. The state has no right to intervene within the groups. Kukata's theory of rights turns out, therefore, to be different in its foundation from Kimlika's proposal, since Kukata's admits that the tradition of a group can limit the right of the individuals who are members of the group. At the same time, Kukatas does not concede to the state the right to intervene in the internal life of the group. 
In his views, a series of little tyrannies represented by the different groups is better than a great tyranny represented by the state. Coleman considers questions and problems connected to the influence of multicultural assumptions, principles, ideas on the legal system. She shows that the admission of multicultural assumptions in the legal system means the violation of equality before the law and of the equal protections of the laws. In Coleman's view, the legal system cannot, may not accept elements of multiculturalism. A legal system may never be exposed to the danger of the cultural differences, since cultural differences damage the condition of the individual's equality before the law. This cultural difference, I, I can anticipate, but I will see it, cultural difference is the way in which a person can be at least partially absolved by a delict, since it is said, well, this person has made this, has done this, but she was under the effect, uh, the influence of the culture, and therefore this at least um, a, a moderation of the of the guiltiness. Well, we will see how it is and how it functions. The equal protection given by the laws on the one hand, and the function of the laws as deterrence against crime on the other hand, are to remain in views of Coleman the foundations of the legal system. Consequently. No element which could put in danger these aspects may be accepted within the legal system. And finally, Brian Berry, which with the four persons of our studies, resolutely refuses any form of group rights, except for the case represented by affirmative actions, which should have anyway limited time horizon. Traditional individual rights are to be integrated through economic and social rights for the individuals, the subject of rights is in Barry's view and how to remain the individual. That is, Barry is against any concession of, in, of rights to groups. Uh, he mentions the affirmative actions, but affirmative action would have a temporary system, a temporary value. They are not the protection of a language, for instance, in a group. But we will see better how does, uh, what does it mean. Barry is resolutely against any conception of constitutions as a mosaic of cultures and groups in which different rights are assigned to different groups. Traditional individual rights are to be extended through social and economic rights, which should nonetheless have as their subject the individual. Social and economic rights are to be directed to the individual. They are to have the individual as their referent. Concession of rights to groups would bring about limitations on individual rights. Individual rights and group rights are, in very few, incompatible with each other. And so, the five thinkers, which I'm now going to analyze, show different positions on right, rights, groups, power of the state, authority of the government, meaning of liberalism, and components of the legal system, and about and the relationships between individuals and groups. The differences give us the possibility to reflect on the complexity of the mentioned themes. Now, in order to begin with an authors, I would begin with the positions of Kimlika. And uh, Kimlika, the position of Kimlika can give us the possibility to reflect on the limits of all those conceptions of rights, which exclusively consider the existence of individual rights, i.e. which limit the range of the possible rights to the traditional individual rights. Kimlika shows Specific group rights can be considered as an extension of individual rights, provided that they are compatible with individual rights. We shall see that the group rights for which Kimilka pleads are interpreted by Kimilka as a completion of the individual rights. The group rights regard the individual dimension insofar as the individual lives in a specific form of life, insofar as the individual lives a way of life with specific traditions, habits, and cultural expressions. And the recognition of specific group rights ensures the continuity of those cultural forms in which the individual has grown up and lives, beginning, for instance, with the language and with the cultural forms connected to the language in which the individual has grown up. These group rights correspond to the way of living of the individual. Specific group rights constitute the completion and the integration of the traditional conception of the individual rights 
since they are connected to the concrete way of living of the individual. They are related to the individual as a historical entity. So the individual who since is a historical entity lives in a specific cultural environment. Kilminka's studies show, described, and analyzed the sufficiency of the traditional individual rights in order that solutions to the limit of the traditional individual rights can be found. Traditional individual rights are necessary, of course, but in Kilminka's views, not sufficient since many problems of contemporary societies cannot be solved through the traditional individual rights. Kilminka asserts the insufficiency of traditional individual rights in the following way. He says uh, in a part of the book, Multicultural Citizenship, a Liberal Theory of Minority Rights, which is one of his most famous book, but not the only one, not at all. Traditional human rights standards are simply unable to resolve some of the most important and controversial questions relating to cultural minorities. This we can see, it is a problem of the minorities, and it is a question of the culture of the minorities. Kimika presents in his text a series of examples which testify to the insufficiency of traditional individual rights, therewith showing that traditional individual rights are insufficient when in a country there are questions and problems related to the presence of minority to be discussed. The requests and the claims of minorities living in a country cannot be solved through traditional individual rights. Kimilka points out that traditional individual rights cannot help us as regards specific problems like these, these, which I am going to mention are not the only one, but are already, they have already a significant. Traditional individual rights cannot solve the question connected to the languages, which are to be recognized as official languages in the case that in a country there is a plurality of languages, for instance. Traditional individual rights do not solve the question whether groups should receive subventions for the education system. Traditional individual rights cannot be used to determine the boundaries of the regions of the country if there are linguistic differences in the regions of a country. And traditional individual rights cannot help us in determining whether there should be or not be a devolution of power to regions. Traditional individual rights, that is, uh, the liberal rights, cannot be of any help if the question needs to be discussed whether the distribution offices are to consider not the ethnical and national composition of a country. In a country in which there are bilingual or multilingual components, a correct language policy how to consider the groups which are present in the country. Let's consider as so parenthetically that Kimlika comes from Canada and Canada has always had these problems of the English majority and the French English-speaking majority and French-speaking minority, whereas, of course, French-speaking minority is a great minority and it uh, occupies the old state of Quebec. And this was always a problem traditionally, both as regards the political system, the distribution of seats in the parliament, the composition of the parties, and, uh, of course, then the educational policy, which should be uh, follow it and uh, promote it in the different states, uh, bilingualism, yeah, yes or not, and protection of French, uh, of the French minority and the French language of French culture and so on. That is, for him, it is uh, rather easy to speak about these problems in relation to some countries of Europe, for instance, in which uh, it is spoken only a language in the great majority. Um, a case in Europe, which can be compared is the case of Belgium, for instance, to Canada. Um, so in order to go forward, any effective language policy cannot be based exclusively on individuals and non-traditional individual rights, because in, in basing on individual rights, we cannot decide how we can promote a study of a language, protect the language and the culture, for instance, a traditional individual rights, such as the right to free speech, cannot give us elements to establish how the language policy in a country should be organized. This is the sense in which Kimika says it is necessary, but not, but not sufficient. Necessary, of course, we, we must have the, 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 the freedom to free speech, but the problem is free speech cannot give us elements in order to understand how we can promote in Canada, in Canada, for instance, the protection of the French culture. This is not which derives from this. We need an extension. The right of the speech 
cannot give us appropriate elements to determine the linguistic strategies which a country should adopt in case of the presence of different linguistic groups in the country itself. It moreover gives no help in determining how linguistic politics should be in the case that a linguistic minority is to be protected against a majority. And the right of free speech cannot give us the needed elements to determine the correct relations between linguistic minorities and linguistic majorities in a country. Hence, in order to solve questions and problems related to the presence of different linguistic groups in a country, resorting to a different field of rights from the traditional individual rights, such as the right of free speech, turns out to be unavoidable. An appropriate integration, extension, and completion of the individual rights are therefore needed. This integration, extension, and completion are, in Kumilka's view, represented by forms of recognition of group rights, which it uh, deserves being underlined, cannot go against the individual rights, that is, they have to be compatible. A group rights must meet specific criteria. This cannot be forgotten. They should be based on and respect traditional individual rights. At least in Kim Lucas' views, traditional individual rights are and remain the foundations of the state order. Group rights have the function of completing them. Therefore, group rights may, under no circumstance, contradict individual rights. Kimika clearly expresses that traditional individual rights cannot be sacrificed or forgotten to the advantage of group rights. Individual individual rights are not expendable. They are not expendable. Never, never, never. As a theory, is a liberal theory of group rights. The group rights, which are recognized and considered within a liberal order, must have at their foundations the traditional individual rights. Otherwise, they, might, they may neither be recognized nor be considered. Group rights have therefore specific limits. They must be compatible with traditional individual rights. The question is therefore to determine group rights so that they do not limit or damage individual rights. The dimension of group rights must be defined so that it does not represent limitation of individual rights. The recognition of group rights has the function of protecting minorities from majorities. Kimika says, uh, here it is uh, again a, a quotation from multicultural citizenship, a liberal theory of minority rights, special group representations rights within the political institution of the larger society make it less likely that a national right in minority will be ignored on decisions that are made on countrywide basis. Self-government rights devolve power to smaller, smaller political units so that a national minority cannot be outvoted or outbid by the majority on decisions that are of particular importance to their culture, such as issues of education, immigration, resource development, language, and family law. That is, they are a trump against the majority, the presence of majority. Um, representation rights considered to a minority will prevent this minority from not being considered if the decisions that are to be taken regard the minority too. Group rights are a trump that minorities have as regards to their relations with majorities. They prove to be, on closer inspection, an instrument of defense against the majorities. The right to self-government gives a national minority the very possibility of not being oppressed by the majority. For instance, the right to self-government means for minorities the possibility of not being oppressed by a majority when the questions to be decided regard the minority itself, such as the culture, the education, the language of the minority. The right to specific religious and cultural practices protects the culture of determined minorities from the disadvantage that the traditions of majority could represent for minorities. All these forms of rights constitute trumps in favor of the minority. They aim at the protection and the promotion of minorities and their relations to the majorities. At the same time, they constitute an extension of individual rights, since individuals belonging to a minority can be protecting his cultural interests through these rights against the tradition and the power of the majority. Group rights are, for Kimika, not only rights for the group as such. It is, um, they serve, serve to the protection of the rights which constitute the culture and the tradition of the individual qua individual. They serve to protect the way of living in which the individual has grown up and in which lives. It would be wrong, therefore, to consider these rights as being exclusively directed to the groups as such. This is not the truth, this is not the truth, it's not the authentic position of Kimlika. 
they are group rights, of course, but these group rights are rights directed to the individual as such too. Group rights protect the individual's concrete way of living, its history, its traditions, its self-acknowledgement in a form of life which is historical, which has become historical. They safeguard the dimension of the individual as a historical being who, since he is a historical being, lives in a specific form of culture, of traditions, of language, and so on. That is, it is, they are individual rights in the sense of that they are directed to the form, way of living of the individual and, and not uh, to the traditional individual rights, which uh, always uh, uh, did not consider the particular history of individuals. The recognition of group rights can nonetheless present dangers. Kimlika is aware of the dangers connected to the recognition of minority rights. He says, recognizing minority rights as obvious dangers. The language of minority rights has been used and abused not only by the Nazis, but also by apologists for racial segregation and the part apartheid. It has also been used by intolerant and belligerent nationalists and fundamentalists throughout the world to justify the domination of people outside their group and the suppression of dissenters within the group. A liberal theory of minority rights, therefore, must explain how minority rights coexist with human rights and how minority rights are limited by principles of individual liberty, democracy, and social justice. Again, from multicultural citizenship, a liberal theory of minority rights. This is another important point for Kimlika. I perhaps will spring a little bit because otherwise I am occupied uh, all by, the time is occupied all by Kumilika. Of course, Kumilika is very rich as a thinker and an analysis of all his position also diffused, spread all over his books and articles would require much, much time. Uh, perhaps only um, only think uh, on the condition for group rights, he says, a liberal view requires freedom within the minority group and equality between the minority and the majority group. This is an important point. And then perhaps, um, so uh, I think uh, we are, have said the, the most of, of, uh, of Kumlika. Uh, we can now say something about Kukatas, who is completely different as thinker, my opinion is very interesting, but uh, it's provocative, so to speak, because uh, it says uh, as principles, I can list here his principles. He uh, says liberalism is not a system of values. Liberalism is an organization based on tolerance. Liberalism is tolerance and nothing else is tolerance. And then tolerance, and we will see what does imply. Tolerance as an independent, not subordinated principle. No independent value is associated with toleration. There is no we over and above the different groups of a society. That is, there is not a state which supervises, supervises everything. Society is an archipelago of different islands, that is, of the different groups of a state. There is no leading authority in a society establishing what morally, what morality is for all groups and associations. There is no supervisor, as said. Public sphere is exclusively, is exclusively a space of convergence of different groups. The public realm is exclusively a sum of different components. There is no interference, there should be no interference from the state in the life of the associations. And liberalism means toleration and toleration even of illiberal groups. That is, the state should tolerate Illiberality, in order to be liberal, illiberality within the groups, which is not accepted by Kimlika, for instance. Persuas persuasion is better than force or enforcement, therefore the state cannot use the force tendentially. And Kata says explicitly, if we should admit an ultimate authority of morality in the state, then liberalism would be lost. Is, therefore, we cannot admit an ultimate authority in the state as regards morality. Now, in order to be a little bit more uh, uh, extensive about Kokata's presuppositions, we can see um, 
uh, there is a contrast uh, uh, in Kukatas between liberalism as tolerance and liberalism as autonomy. The two models of liberalism can produce societies with completely different organizations. It could be said that these two kinds of liberalists do not have any kind of relationship with each other. And uh, in order to show the context of particular interpretation of liberalism or tolerance, I will take into consideration some ideas expressed by Kukata in his essay, Cultural Toleration. The central point of Kukata's thesis as regards the construction of his interpretation of toleration is the denial that there is a we beyond and besides the different individuals and the different groups forming a society. There is actually for Kukata's no we over and above groups and individuals that can decide what is right or what is wrong in the life organization of groups and individuals. This, this is a central point, in my opinion, of the logic of Kukatas. We have the guy, I have, we have got the habit to think of thinking. There is a we in the public sphere over and above the groups. And this we decide a common a uh, network of morality for all groups, something which is, um, so to speak, uh, uh, accorded the value by all the groups. And Kukata says, no, there is no way. We have the groups. These groups are like, like the islands of an archipelago in the state, within the state, and they are independent from each other. There is no importance, it is not important, it has no relevance at all for Kukatas that the different groups respect each other. They should not, they are not, they do not need to respect each other. The only important thing is that the different groups tolerate each other. Toleration is the, the principle. And there is no, nothing else over the, the, the different islands of the archipelago, over, over the different groups. Therefore, he says many times, there is no we over and above the groups. This is important. The, the logic of the Kukatas derives from this. That is, there is no we and liberalism is a toleration. <clears throat> this is a point Kukatas compares in his works to concept of liberalism with each other. Liberalism is a complex of values and moral standards. And in a certain sense, Kumlika is of this position because for Kumrika, the liberalism is values, free speech, but it's also uh, liberalism as protection of minorities, liberalism as protection of the way of living historically of the individuals. But Kumrika has no doubt about the presence of values and moral standards in liberalism. But Kukatas does not think so, not at all. He says, liberalism is a principle through which different moral standards coexist. That is, it, liberalism, it is a settlement. The settlement, it is not, nothing else than the settlement in which, through which the different groups exist. And the different groups should determine, should uh, have the possibility to determine within themselves how they exist, live, decide to live, and so on and so forth. But the liberalism has nothing to do with values. Liberalism is the settlement, the path, the covenant through which the different groups live in toleration, in a, in a order of toleration with each other. Kukatas adopts the second conception of liberalism. Liberalism is not, in his opinion, a system of values. Here is Kukatas very clear. Liberalism has nothing to do with values, with the determination of values. Liberalism is an organization based on the reciprocal tolerance between the different components of the our community. It is not important, the opinion of Kukatas, that the different components have reciprocal respect towards each other. This has no relevance. They should only tolerate themselves, nothing more. They can eat themselves, but there is, it is not, not, not relevant which feelings they have. They should tolerate this, yes. Respect is irrelevant. The only relevant thing is that the different components of the society accept the coexistence between each other. This is the only relevant point. To accept the coexistence between each other, not respect. So 
but acceptation of coexistence. The image of the archipelago explains the general conception of Kukatas. A society is constituted by different components. These different components are independent from each other. They form islands, archipelago. Moreover, there is no superior system over and above the archipelago. There is no superior instance, no superior authority, which may impose values. All the relationships between the parts of the archipelago are tolerance and nothing else. Uh, in order to quote, to make a quotation from his studies, uh, cultural toleration, but also the, the, the liberal archipelago is a very interesting book. This uh, cultural toleration is an article. I want to suggest, suggest uh, says Kukatis, however, that the problem should be approached differently in a way which does not presuppose the existence or the authority of the state. That is to say, I want to begin without presuming that it is already established that there is a we who are faced with the problem of determining how far to tolerate particular groups in our midst. There is no we. Kukatas does not resort to the authority of the state in order to found tolerance and to establish what can be tolerated and what cannot be tolerated. There is no we who judge the extent and the limit of toleration. And perhaps I make a little spring because I see that the time is flowing, unfortunately. Um, let's see um, whether I can. Uh, perhaps this quotation is important on public space as a convergence of different groups rather than conceive of the public realm as embodying an established standpoint of morality, which reflects the desirable level of stability and social unity, we should think of the public realm as an area of convergence of different moral practices. A convergence, the choice of the word is very important, a convergence. It is not unity, it's not fusion, it's only conversion. They converge, but they remain uh, separated from each other. All societies, to varying degrees, harbor, a variety of religions, languages, ethnicities, and cultural practices, and so a variety of moral ideas. The public realm is the product of interaction among these various ways. Indeed, it is a kind of settlement, settlement, reflecting the need of people of different ways to develop some common standards by which to regulate the interaction, given that interaction is unavoidable. But it is nothing more than this. It is, it is not a fusion. There is not, not something which comes out from this interaction. Uh, it is only a, a, a question of coexistence. Now, perhaps I should uh, go forward because I would like to say something also on, on uh, Coleman and on Barry. Of course, also the position of Kukatas are very complex, very rich and they would need uh, um, very, very, very much time in order to be uh, analyzed and also discussed and eventually also criticized because of course one can also find elements which are not so compelling in Kukatas, but anyway, we can reserve it for the discussion. Now, Coleman, Coleman uh, uh, who comes from the juridical uh, environment um, uh, has faced the problems of the compatibility between system of laws and the multiculturalist principle. Multiculturalism leads, in her opinion, to an individualization of justice, which is not compatible at all with the equality before laws and with the equal protection of the laws. And therefore, she has um, invented the formula Choosing rights before culture. These rights should always go over the culture and should precede the culture of the position of the, of the different persons. The analysis written by Coleman described the danger which can be represented by the assumption of determinant cultural rights in juridical system. To better analyze the question of the cultural differences, I would like to take into consideration some points of uh, her article, Individualizing Justice Through Multiculturalism, the Liberal Stylem. The title of the article introduces us to the main problem with which multiculturalists are confronted. If certain group rights are conceded, the equality of the citizens before the law can be in danger. Group rights can become a danger if they are admitted into the legal system. 
As regards the concept of individualizing justice, Coleman says, individualizing justice, the phrase describes the process of which criminal and constitutional law doctrine affords defendants a subjective evaluation of their moral culpability because one can always say, I was influenced by my culture when I make so-and-so, and therefore I am not completely responsible or not responsible at all for what I said. My culture has made me uh, do something, some criminal things. Uh, she says, in these cases, the defense presented that the prosecutor or court accepted cultural evidence as an excuse for the otherwise criminal conduct of immigrant defendants. These official decisions appear to reflect the notion that moral culpability of an immigrant defendant, she speaks of the United States, should be judged according to his or her own cultural standards rather than those of the relevant jurisdictions. Although no state has formally recognized the use of exonerating cultural evidence, some commentators and judges have labeled this strategy the cultural defense. This defense in, a crim in criminal law, we are always speaking about criminal law, only of these, it is rather limited as questions, but of course it's very important. Anyway, cultural defense is a, 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 a kind of justification of, of, um, of particular crimes. Individual cultural influences are used in order to find particular grounds for the criminal behavior of the person having committed a crime. Of course, these grounds are all grounds limiting the culpability of the person. The court decisions have the common characteristic that the moral culpability of certain person must be judged on the basis of her own cultural standards. These cultural standards limit in a certain measure the objective jurisdiction. The strategy lying at the basis of the cultural defense is in general that the culpability of a person depends on the cultural environment from which a person comes. It is not, in other words, only a question of the law system that should establish the judgment of the behavior of a person. And this is the kernel of the of uh, Coleman's uh, thinking. Um, as she says, um, uh, yeah, for instance, should the law system be interpreted in a pluralistic way or not? And she says, no, of course not, in her opinion, because the equal protection of the law should establish that there cannot be something which limits the culpability of a person, culturally, uh, culturally said. And she said, the introductory illustrations exemplify this debate in the legal arena with unusual clarity because they pit foreign customs and cultural practices directly against the essential elements of a contemporary American legal culture, including the discrimination principle, the central to equal protection doctrine, a related principles of universal rights are at the foundation of feminist legal doctrine. And now in order, I see that uh, we have uh, nearly finished at the time, but I would like to, to uh, end also here, yeah, can we see that, uh, we can see that the questions are very many and which needs a long discussion. The article is uh, among other things, very long and very complex. But I would like to uh, say something about Barry and Barry, because Barry and Barry is uh, important for another principle that is, is resolutely against every form of multicultural rights. It is uh, Barry as principles of Barry can be mentioned the following ones, rights are to be assigned to individuals qua individuals, not to individuals qua members of groups. That is the individual as individuals is important, it's relevant, there is no relevance to be assigned, no relevance at all to be assigned to individuals since they are members of groups. <clears throat> he uh, is a strenuous defendant of the Enlightenment project of individual rights. He for this and accept, of course, social and economic rights as extension and completion of civil rights, but only for individual, only in individual perspective. And he says liberalism is not absolutely blind towards groups. Right for groups may be conceded in cases of disadvantaged groups. This concession of rights ought to be temporary, though. It should be suppressed with the end of the disadvantaged conditions. It is not a concession due to the, due to the culture of the group. 
it is due to the disadvantage condition of the group. That is, it is an, a, a kind of affirmative actions. In this case, Barry Mike makes an exception. He says, yes, in this case, we can have group rights in case of affirmative actions for groups which are underdeveloped in a society due to historical grounds, due to social grounds, due to uh, any ground whatsoever. We have a group which is penalized in society. In this case, we can make affirmative action towards these groups, but they are not cultural rights. They are economical rights directed to disadvantaged groups in a society. But he refuses always rise due to cultural grounds. He points out the dangers represented by cultural traditions for individual rights. And he refuses always the conception inspired by it's part of my culture. Um, uh, as, uh, as regards the definition of liberalism, Barry says, the defining feature of liberalism is I maintain the principle of equal freedom that underwrite basic liberal institutions, civil equality, freedom of speech and religion, non-discrimination, equal opportunity, and so on. And so um, we uh, can perhaps uh, end uh, the, the, um, these, um, these, um, these um, uh, observation with uh, a repetition of uh, Barry's position of uh, of the question of underprivileged groups. These Barry believes that certain rights can be conceded to underprivileged groups. These rights should be eliminated though when the inequality and the disadvantage that these rights should solve are eliminated. These rights are not rights that are conceded to the group qua group as group, with reference to the culture of the group and with the aim to protect the culture of the group. There is something completely different. These rights are conceded in order that a determined group, which is in a difficult economic condition, can be helped economically and socially. Therefore, these rights are a kind of compensation, economical compensation, social compensation, but they are not, they have nothing to do with the protection of a culture. That is, the perspective is completely different from that of Kumilka, and in truth, Barry always polemizes against Kumilka. In, always, always in the book, in his books, uh, in his articles, uh, Kumilka is the uh, Kumilka and the defense of cultural rights are the negative aim, the negative target of Barry. These rights, the rights uh, as affirmative actions, are therefore conceded in order that the disadvantaged group can obtain the kind of equality which constitute the ground principle of liberalism. Liberalism is affirmation and promotion of equality among citizens when this equality is not present. This is the opinion of Barry, and I can, I think that exhausted my time, therefore I can uh, uh, and hear my exposition. I hope that I have uh, at least managed to give an idea of the problems. There are, of course, very many, and they are much more complex than I have presented because there is, of course, the mutual discussion and the criticism of the different authors, for instance, especially Kumlika against Berry and vice versa. Uh, but anyway, we can see uh, one thing that is uh, there is uh, a, um, a tendency uh, towards the concession of, uh, uh, of group rights as an extension of group rights, uh, uh, individual rights in Kumlika. Um, in Kukatas, there is uh, likewise a concession, um, a concession of, of group rights, uh, even though these group rights goes against the individual rights. Coleman uh, is limited to the juridical aspect, and she says there should not be no insertion of multiculturalism in the legal system because this goes against the equal protection of the laws and the equality of the individual before the laws. And finally, Barry says no group rights because group rights, in opinion of Barry, uh, proves to be sooner or later something which goes against and is incompatible with the individual rights. Therefore, we have to choose to, to remain on the plan 
on the dimension of individual rights and do not accept uh, group rights. Um, that's all. I thank you very much for your attention and for your invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gyan. It was really very deep and insightful presentation. And uh, uh, it is well articulated and very, very deep. And uh, we all know that all political power uh, is inherent uh, in the people and the governments derive their just power from the consent of the government. In that context, the understanding of individual right, group right, and multiculturalism is very, very, very important. Now, I request a uh, respected uh, uh, chair of today's session, uh, Dr. Raghu Kumarji, kindly share his insights on your deep presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Gandhian School of Democracy and Socialism. Today, we have a wonderful session on uh, the ongoing debate about rights and uh, uh, Professor uh, Gyan Lugiji uh, has att attempted to synthesize uh, four of the best thinkers on the on the on the philosophy of rights, uh, especially uh, Kimblikos, Bukatos, Kolaman, and Barry. It's a very tough task, in in fact, uh, because uh, the the discourse on rights is undergoing a tremendous change, especially during the second half of the twentieth century. Uh, even uh, we know that uh, uh, taking the right seriously in uh, Donald Dworkin's uh, uh, book, he, he categorically says that rights of individuals against the state exist outside of the written law and function of, as trumps against the interests and wishes of the majority. So the, the discourse uh, previously, we have understood rights as uh, something like political and civil rights and of group rights and also of uh, the rights in the majority discourse now is uh, being challenged uh, by the by the individuals as well as the minority groups so a situation has come uh, even within india that uh, the idea of uh, rights have to be revisited from the from the stage of the constitutional goals which we have reached uh, between 1946 to 1950 in the context specific context of uh, our anti-colonial struggle and establishing a new democratic uh, 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 sovereign state in india so now uh, of late uh, for see for example the indian constitution recognizes uh, certain religious rights in article 25 and also certain cultural rights in article 19 and 30 29 and 30 but the, 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 for the past a decade, uh, a, a debate is uh, arising between what it exactly means by cultural rights. Because uh, uh, the issue is now the camp panchayas in certain areas are ascertaining their power to discipline these uh, groups and societies with their, uh, with their uh, what's called as group power or uh, the power tradition has given to them. So a discourse of rights has reached a certain level now where we cannot avoid uh, uh, what is called as a, uh, a revisiting of the idea of rights. Uh, this is a, a discussion which is there almost uh, uh, everywhere uh, in the world, including India. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank Professor Gyan Lugi, Lugi uh, for introducing us to a, a, a conceptualization of rights in the context of uh, the experience of uh, last four or five decades. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, it's, I hope uh, that this discussion will definitely increase our understanding of our rights, democracy, multiculturalism, and rights vis-a-vis -vis the individual and the groups. So it's a, it's a wonderful contribution, sir. We are very uh, thankful to you for your wonderful contribution. And uh, now I welcome uh, uh, sharp and uh, short questions from the audience so that uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, can answer uh, and enlighten us further in this regard. Thank you very much, uh, Gandhian School of Democracy and Socialism, for a wonderful discussion today. Thank you. We invite now uh, uh, questions from uh, either in the form of uh, a chat box or uh, I'm not finding any uh, specific questions in the chart. 
Randhiji, uh, thank I, you. I hope yes. uh, you can invite uh, uh, people to uh, raise their uh, questions. Yes. I request a uh, respected participant to share. Yes, uh, Satish ji has raised his hand. Saninath. Satinath, yes, please unmute and ask your question. Uh, I'm sorry, I joined the group uh, uh, a bit late. But um, and so I, I'm not very sure uh, whether uh, when uh, individual right, group right, and cultural rights uh, are um, kind of in conflict with each other, uh, then what is, which, which right has to be given priority over the others? Uh, yes, I yes, I request Professor Gyan to please note down this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Not on this question, and I request uh, Miniti Pradhanji. And see, taking some time, as uh, one of our respected friends has uh, also raised uh, that uh, in, in the same context, in the very conflict between individual right and group right, which right prevails, particularly in the cost in in the context of uh, feminism or women's right. Another friend, uh, Aisa, is, uh, uh, has written one question. Is the rights consequence of democracy? There is one another question directly uh, came to me. Is about uh, with the advent of postmodernist jurisprudence, subjective ethnic rights are emerging. So, and what are your opinion in the cost in the context of Mediterranean democracy? How how Mediterranean democracy changed the justice system? This is the another question by Rahman. So these are the three questions initially. Uh, yes, uh, I thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think though, uh, in regards the question of the, uh, if I correctly understand, the precedence precedence of uh, of rights, which rights should be given the, the priority, precedence. In, in the context of uh, of Kumlik, I would say because yeah we we should perhaps concentrate on his positions and the other ones are uh, do not uh, do not deal precisely with this problem. Well, uh, as said, Kimlika is clear about uh, the question that individual uh, traditional rights, uh, the right to vote, the right to speech, uh, the right uh, the uh, the, the right of uh, first, first the, the equality before the laws and so on and so forth. These uh, individual rights are not expendable. That is, if we speak of uh, an, an ideal uh, precedence as regards rights, Kimlika would say always uh, the priority uh, belong to the individual rights. Uh, because these are the foundation, the basis of the common life, because these are the foundation of the state, because these are the foundation of the freedom of the individual. And we cannot, uh, we, we, if we are in a liberal way of living, of course, we cannot limit the freedom of individuals. Uh, therefore, individual rights should always uh, be as a basis of the foundation of the state, should always be as, be in a, as the basis of the foundation of the country. Uh, the problem is, uh, I said that in the opinion of Kimlika, these uh, rights, the individual rights, the traditional individual rights were sufficient uh, up to a certain point in history, since we 
state had not so much the problems of, or a state did not want to uh, face, to cope with the problem of the different cultures. And this, of course, in the opinion of Krimnica, has to uh, great injustice, has brought to great injustice, led to great injustice, because minorities have been penalized by majorities. He has, Krimnica has the experience of Canada, because he is a Canadian, and he knows that the French minority was penalized up to until the 60s years, uh, years of the past century uh, to the advantage of the English majority. And then there was a different, there was a turning point and uh, uh, minority groups were accepted and the climate of the state changed. Uh, therefore, um, it is a question of, uh, uh, of, uh, um, of traditional individual rights, which are not expendable. And on the other hand, of recognizing that since an individual has a culture that is, uh, he, he is not a void in the brain, but he has a culture, he has a language, he has a history, his traditions, and he grows up in, uh, in an environment which is cultural. This is his way of living, his form of living, and to deprive him, to penalize him because of his way of living would be a great injustice in the same way. Therefore, to speak of group rights is true, is authentic, but it is not the all question of cumulica. Group rights are, on close inspection, individual rights too, because they protect the concrete way of living. If I am French-speaking Canada, of course, I would be deprived of my rights to leave my culture, to leave my language, to leave my religion, to leave everything else as Frenchmen, as traditional Frenchmen, um, uh, if the English majority would say, no, you cannot speak French, you cannot uh, uh, have school uh, with a budget, with a public budget, um, but only private schools, uh, or French cannot be the language of the official documents, and so on and so forth. This is a question that is precedence is always a question of individual rights. But on the other hand, we should see also the, the, the injustice which can be made against a minority and against an individual who is belonging to a minority. If this individual is humiliated insofar as he belongs to a minority and is not allowed to live as member of a minority with his culture. This is, uh, I would say, the 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 point of, of Kimlika about the precedence. Individual rights are not expendable, he's clear about this. Uh, as regards riots as consequence of democracy, well, this is also a question which is very difficult, very complex. Uh, I would say, no, uh, of course, uh, yeah, we should also, uh, define what we mean as riots. If we want to have a society in which everything is controlled, this is not a democratical uh, society uh, controlled by the state and everything is, so to speak, uh, limited and ordered by the state. Uh, a certain, certain a kind of a contrast is uh, connatural to democracy, I would say. That is, democracy should uh, accept there is not riots, because of course riots is, are among another thing, but a certain degree of contrast, of course, in the limit of the public respect and of the protection of life, is to be accepted in a democracy because democracy means also a contrast between different positions. And therefore we cannot eliminate totally the contrast in if we are in democracy. But riots, I would say, are another thing that is no democracy can accept 